now need to consider new product development. Many companies are spending uh, millions of pounds per annum in research and development looking to improve either existing products or to introduce totally new products onto the market. There is a need, a requirement in society for people to want more things, that's called consumerism, and to want better versions of items that already exist in the market. But then there might be uh, companies looking to introduce things that were not necessarily in the minds of the consumer, things that they didn't really know that they needed. Um, an example of this uh, might be perhaps, who knows, the iPod or the iPad or the iPhone. Five, ten years ago, did we really need these products? But certainly, um, over the intervening years, many people have bought them, so presumably, yes, they do think they do need them. So new products are essential to a company. They are what's called the lifeblood of the company, the successful future of that company. So we look at the stages of new product development. Uh, it commences with what is called idea generation. The people in the company should be encouraged to think about the possibility of new ideas, new products. As I say, products that exist can be improved upon or indeed totally new products. This is done in many different ways. Some companies uh, use um, perhaps um, regular meetings called brainstorming meetings where groups uh, of people that are employed in the company meet and discuss uh, possible uh, scenarios for the future. And some of those might seem strange or unusual, um, outlandish, uh, but then someone else can latch on to someone's idea and think about taking that further and developing it. And sometimes new products do develop from that. Another uh, simple method is the one of a suggestions box where people have an idea for a new product, they write it down once they've developed it in their mind and uh, they perhaps uh, word process it, put it in an envelope, pop it into the suggestions box with their name on. And in due course, um, the company may then look at all those uh, suggestions uh, in that month and uh, select a winning idea for the month and that person may then um, um, perhaps be rewarded with some money. Um, and then uh, at the end of the year, the 12 best ideas, the best idea per month put forward, uh, is then compared against the others for the remainder of the year. And the best idea of the year, that person there will receive perhaps something uh, more beneficial to them um, should uh, that be seen to be the best idea from within the company. Uh, companies such as Ford, Ford Motor Company, have used this uh, method in the past. And later on, if there's a new idea that they develop further and they introduce it into the manufacture of a new car, then again, uh, it may be that that employee uh, receives a small percentage of the benefit of the inclusion of that element in the car for the first 12 months of uh, manufacture. So they may uh, receive, who knows, uh, possibly two or three hundred thousand uh, pounds from that idea being utilised in the manufacture of the car and uh, therefore eventually entering the marketplace. So idea generation is the first stage. Idea screening is a one of sifting and selecting between ideas. How do we choose between one idea and another? Very often companies look at what are called their core competencies and say, well, we're good at manufacturing this, we're good at making that, and they may stay with uh, the type of idea that fits quite well with what it is that they are currently producing anyway. Uh, others might be braver and go outside of that and say, well, we can set up a subsidiary company uh, if we're going to launch this other product, this other idea, simply because it's very different from anything that we do uh, currently. Third idea is the business analysis. How are, we, how are we going to go about being quite professional in our sifting of these um, thoughts, these ideas uh, for future products or future services? We could look at some considerations here. One is the expected level of demand. How many people do we think will want this? Um, if it's uh, uh, business to consumer marketing. Indeed, how many companies may want this if it's business to business marketing? Then we need to look at competition. Is the competition already in that market? Or would we be coming out with a product where there is limited competition or indeed no competition at all? Uh, currently. That might be quite attractive to us. 
And the third area is the likely life cycle. How long do we think the product will be likely to exist successfully in the market should we introduce it? The fourth area is normally, if it's a product, the development of a prototype. We produce a version. Uh, it might be just a mock-up or a model. It may actually uh, be a working version. We produce a version um, and then we can um, um, get interested people, people from our target group, um, to come and see the product, perhaps to see it working. In some instances, if it's uh, perhaps a, um, an item for the kitchen, electrical product, we can do a working version and introduce it into a number of homes and get the, um, uh, the person who's the uh, leading uh, cook, if you like, leading uh, chef in the home to do their um, cooking in the home and use this product for perhaps uh, three months, even six months. And they could uh, write a diary on uh, usage of the product and how they found it uh, uh, working and how suitable it was for their needs and possibly any suggestions on improvement or change. Then the company uh, from this limited uh, piece of field research can take that information back and modify the product, uh, make it uh, slightly different in size or shape or weight, uh, improve its uh, speed of uh, producing or mixing, if it's a food mixer or something of that nature, or blender. Um, and then they can uh, look to improve that then based upon these comments, these results, before then looking to take it further in the marketplace. Normally companies go on to test market the product, they find a region of a country in which they're going to launch it and they're going to test it in that area for a number of months. Uh, the company Cadbury who make chocolate products very often in the past have tested using uh, uh, North Wales, they use that as a test bed as it's called and they test the possible launch of a new chocolate bar in that area. Um, they do research uh, once people have actually bought the product from shops in that area, tried it, tested it, possibly purchased it again, hopefully, and uh, uh, then Cadbury come along through the research company and um, they uh, ask uh, through questionnaires, ask these people their thoughts on the product and get a fair indication of uh, whether they like it or not, whether they continue buying it or, or not. And they can see sales volumes and repeat purchasing patterns and that helps them towards a decision as to whether to launch the product nationally in the future. <coughs> then, so that no-go, or indeed go decision is made. No-go, we won't launch it. Go, yes we will go ahead and launch the product in the market. And that leads to the final stage, which is the one known as commercialization. Commercialization, the launch of the product throughout the entire country. So that is NPD, new product development. That fits in nicely with what I said earlier, the marketing mix. I mentioned to you earlier the first P of the marketing mix, product. And when we produce a product, we need to consider not only the product itself, but also naming that product. And we have to choose a name that is suitable for the product and is not in use by another company or indeed owned by another company. Some companies do a lot of research on this. Uh, the Ford Motor Company once launched uh, a car called Mondeo. Uh, the Mon was a part of one word and Deo was from another word entirely. They brought these two sets of three letters together to form a word that was a brand new word and research showed that it was acceptable to everyone. It wasn't upsetting to anyone. It meant they could use that name <coughs> in launching the car in many, many different countries. We also need to consider the packaging of the product. How are we going to package it? Uh, Coca-Cola are famous uh, traditionally for their bottle, which was glass. Later on, their bottle became a plastic bottle. And of course, now Coca-Cola is bought in cans. Uh, the large two litre version is still in a bottle, a very large um, uh, plastic, sop, uh, plastic bottle. So packaging is very important as well when we consider product. The product itself, uh, the name, the ingredients, of course, and the packaging. Then we need to consider price. How are we going to price the product? I mentioned earlier our segmentation, our look at how we're going to look at the market, subdivide the market, choose the suitable group to buy the product. <coughs> that will help us. We can charge a higher price, logically, to wealthier people, but if our, we're aiming our product at uh, mass market or to people who are on a lower income, then we will obviously have to charge a lower price for that. The place, where are we going to make it convenient for people to buy? Is it a product that should be sold through supermarkets? 
Is it a product that should be sold through uh, pharmacy outlets? Is it a product that people can actually order online? We need to think of that for our product. Promotion, that is, uh, of course, the famous one. Uh, most people think of that as advertising, which isn't strictly true. Advertising is above the line. Uh, advertising allows us above the line promotion, and we can advertise there in the UK on commercial television, commercial radio. These are non-BBC channels. We cannot advertise on BBC, which is illegal in the UK. So we have commercial television, commercial radio. We can advertise at the cinema. Um, for example, Levi Jeans have done that successfully in the past. We can advertise um, in print, newspapers and magazines. We can advertise outdoor and transport. That would involve advertising uh, on poster sites or billboards. We can advertise, for example, on the sides of buses. We can advertise in the underground. Uh, um, we can advertise within the station. We can advertise um, on the platform. We can advertise across track, the other side of the track on the underground. And we can advertise within the uh, tube trains themselves. Then we need to consider the new media. We can advertise in the modern age via internet. We can advertise via uh, mobile phones. We can also uh, advertise elsewhere. We can advertise in ambient media. Ambient media will be very unusual places. We can advertise, for example, in London, in Bond Street, on the tube station. When people are leaving the station to go out into the street, into Oxford Street, where the steps are, there's advertising where those risers are. And that's advertising for McDonald's, telling you that McDonald's is uh, just nearby. It might be uh, 80 yards away, providing you turn left. It's actually telling you that McDonald's is nearby. An unusual place to place uh, to be uh, advertising, to place your advertisement. Some companies do the unusual thing of advertising at universities on the backs of the toilet doors. When students visit the toilet at university, then they see this very unusually placed advertisement, and it's one that cannot be missed. So that is called the area of ambient media. So advertising is above the line across those seven areas. Then there are other forms of promotion or communication which are called below the line. There's a wide variety of these. These can involve, for example, uh, direct uh, marketing, reaching people through direct mail to their letterbox. It can involve the use of um, um, sales promotion, special offer, a, a coupon for example, 10% off coupon, or uh, the opportunity to sample a product free. Uh, we can consider public relations where we get, uh, shall we say, press releases within uh, newspapers or magazines about the launch of our new product, shall we say. Um, we can offer sponsorship. Sponsorship is a growing area, um, famously the Football World Cup and uh, Grand Prix motor racing and of course the Olympics and in, uh, next year 2012 that Olympics will be held in London. We can produce uh, leaflets or brochures or catalogues. We can attend exhibitions um, and have a stall at an exhibition or uh, a conference or a seminar or an international trade fair. We can produce promotional films and DVDs. Um, we can actually have our product or something in relation to our product at point of sale within uh, a store. So that means that when people are queuing uh, at the checkout uh, to pay for their purchases, our product can be right by the checkout, perhaps a magazine, perhaps a bar of chocolate. So we can actually promote in that way. And of course we can do corporate identity. We can pro promote our company by name, by logo, by um, so uh, Nike for example with their swoosh. Uh, we can have a uh, slogan or sign off line, just do it. Um, and uh, so we can promote in that way of promoting ourselves, our corporate colours. Um, and our business cards and indeed our letter headings on our letters when we write to um, uh, consumers. So we can promote in that way uh, corporately. Now these are all referred to as below the line. 
So we have a number of above the line um, areas for promotion called advertising. The others are not advertising, but they are below the line promotional opportunity, promotional activity. We then need to consider in the modern age customer service, of course. How do we keep our customers happy uh, in buying the product and indeed once they bought the product? Are we going to provide warranties or guarantees, particularly for something expensive such as a motor car? We then need to go into the uh, area of uh, people. We need to train people to look after our customers to the best advantage, particularly if they telephone in and have a, a question, a query, a complaint. Or if we're going to be online with a website, we can introduce onto that frequently asked questions. We can ha have that site available, that page available for people to visit to have their question answered in that way. We need to consider the process. How are people going to obtain our product? How are they going to go about that? And if it's a service that is obviously more difficult uh, than a product which is physical, so a service might be an invisible, but they still need to know how they go about obtaining that. Uh, perhaps a, a theatre ticket, they want to book that uh, two weeks beforehand. Yes, they can do that online. And again, the physical evidence. If they book a theatre ticket online, they can uh, then receive perhaps a, a, a special number. And when they go and uh, visit the theatre, uh, on the evening they're going to see the show, they can quote that number at the box office and be handed their tickets uh, ready to take through to the entrance doors to be allowed into the auditorium to actually see the, um, see the play or the show that they're going to uh, be visiting. OK, so we need to consider product. Product. A product is like a human being. That sounds rather strange. A product is like a human being because it has a life. A product is born, it grows, it matures, it dies, just as a human being on this planet. So when we have a new product, we're going to launch it onto the market. We're going to introduce it into the market. Okay? That's the first stage, the product life cycle. Okay? Introduction or launch. Then the product needs to grow if it's going to be successful. It needs to sell. It needs to sell more often. The same people need to come by and buy us and purchase it a second or third or fourth time, repeat purchasing. They need to tell their friends, their neighbours, their relatives that it's a good product and so they might also then go out and buy the product. So it begins to grow in the market. Then over time the market becomes mature. Uh, the market for this product is not um, uh, growing any longer, it is becoming static. It is now reaching its peak sales, its peak profitability, but the market has slowed down. Many companies who do that within a market, within one country, for example, then look to see if they can introduce that uh, product now into an additional market. So now it's at the mature stage in uh, the first market or country, and they're now going to start again by launching it or an introductory stage within another market, another country in the world. It'll be in that country, that market, for the first time ever. So after maturity, which can be for many, many years, Eventually, there will be a slowdown, a decline will begin to take place. Uh, two stages of that. The first one is early decline, which is called saturation, and then there is the second stage decline, where it begins to become much more rapid. So, it can look as a diagram, launch, growth, maturity, saturation, and decline. The product life cycle. So, a product has a life, just, as I say, like a human being has a life. Some products are only, short, um, only in the market for a very short time in terms of uh, uh, being sold in high volume. Uh, a famous one historically was a product called Rubik's Cube. Many people know the Rubik's Cube, and that was very, very successful for a short time and now sells only in very low volume. Uh, another one was quite a famous one, uh, uh, actually uh, as a, a, a computer game, a video game, and that was a product called Tetris. Very successful for a very short time. Other products do last a great deal longer. I mentioned Coca-Cola earlier. Coca-Cola now is 125 years old. Just think of that. Coca-Cola was born many, many years ago in the 1880s in the United States 
and it still exists today, and it is selling worldwide in greater quantity than ever before. It has now become quite um, uh, mature, could even be argued it's actually in the saturation stage in the United States, its home of origin, but in other countries, uh, such as India, uh, the volume is still growing greatly each year. So that is a product that's been around for, uh, as I say, well over 120 years and shows no sign of slowing down just yet. So examples of products. We tend to think of products as being um, large items, uh, perhaps or washing machines, dishwashers, cookers. These are important products within the home, within the kitchen. Microwave ovens. Uh, they have become very successful in the uh, last uh, 30, 40 years. Motor cars. Motor cars are again uh, products that people uh, enjoy. Um, and of course uh, they've been around with us uh, again uh, for over 100 years. Computers. They've been around with us much longer. They were originally in the business to business market. Um, IBM were producing mainframe computers only to be sold to companies. And now, of course, probably everyone has a computer, either as a, um, a PC or as a laptop or as a handheld device. Indeed, arguably, you could even call your mobile phone a computer because it has many more uses than just usage as a phone. 